Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode one of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D-0-5. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. And that's producer Neil, who will also be joining the team this season. Yes. Hey, producer Neil. I'm ready. And with that, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Inhospitable. The release date was October 16th, 2021. The in-episode dates were February 25th, February 25th, one year later, and March 22nd. The writer was Greg Weissman, the director was Christopher Berkeley, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits for this episode. Troy Baker as everyone, Todd Connor, Ress Edda, and Com Blancs. Ben Diskin as McCall Moors and Colin Rowe. Carl Lumley as Maat Moors. Carrie Walgren as Joanne Moors. Hayden Walsh as Emery Johns. And Tara Strong as Bethany Lee Carr and Tara Markov. Nice. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts with a flashback to the end of season three, where Connor and McGann reaffirm their engagement. And I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> we then cut to one year later, where McGann and Connor, along with Beast Boy and Martian Manhunter, are getting ready to leave for Mars for their wedding. We also get some quick updates on where a bunch of other characters stand at the moment, one year post season three. Harper Rowe and her brother are now living with Snapper Carr, Brion still won't answer Halo's calls, and Garfield's on edge for as yet unknown reasons. We'll get into it. <laughs> as Bioship takes off for this space road trip, we cut back to a woman wearing a Legion ring, watching them go. Again, we'll get into it. Mm -hmm. And Rich is here, so Rich can finally shout about this. <laughs> After the credits, we cut to the Bioship team arriving on Mars. After the month-long space trip in the underground capital city of Ma'alika Ma Andra, where they meet up with McGann's sister, Emery. Emery is currently acting as the lead scientist on a Mars-Earth Zeta tube project that Martian Manhunter has agreed to help with. Afterward, McGann, Connor, and Garfield make their way to the Moors household, but on their way through the city, they get telepathically accosted by a group of Martians who don't seem too happy about the outsider's presence on Mars. As we leave the area, we get a shot of a green Martian wearing the same Legion ring we saw earlier in the episode. We then head over to McGann's parents' house, where everybody gets reunited, shares some excitement over the wedding, and we get a crash course in the contentious Martian caste system and the fact that most of McGann's family, including her 27 other siblings, will not be attending the wedding. Meanwhile, we find out that not everyone is on board with the Earth-Mars Zeta project or any further contact with Earth, and the tensions have been escalating on Mars, resulting in a mob vandalizing the Moors household, confronting our heroes, and even brain-blasting Garfield. McGann's dad informs us that the societal upheaval has only gotten worse since King Saturn, the progressive leader of Mars who has been working to mitigate the caste system and foster cooperation between planets, was murdered last month. The case has been unsolved ever since, with both white and green Martians blaming each other for the assassination and leaving the queen in charge and rolling back most of the reforms. We then cut over to McGann's brother Macomb, rallying a large group of white Martians to rise up against the green Martians as well as Earth. And then we cut over to Bioship, who's just had a little baby Bioship through alien cell division, and it's far cuter than any spaceship has ever any right to be. <laughs> yes. Meanwhile, several things happen at once. The Zeta 2 project is set to go forward only for Res, Etta, and a thousand other Martians to petition the Queen to stop the project and end cooperation with Earth. Before the Zeta 2 can be used, McGann catches McComb lurking invisibly in a corner of the lab, but determines he hadn't been there long enough to tamper with anything. 
The queen is able to defuse the mob with Martian Manhunter's help, but just as John steps into the Zeta tube, it explodes and he's nowhere to be found. We then pan out just enough to see some dude in a weird energy sphere lurking just out of sight. And over the credits, we hear a conversation between Black Canary and Halo discussing the latter's mental health, their complicated feelings about Brion, and their desire to explore their own relationship to Islam. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So I feel like I'm, I have had several... This is more interesting because I have questions for you almost more than I have information for you both more than I have information for myself. So for, for feeling the aster in hindsight, with as much time as we have had, there came a stark realization for me when rewatching these episodes within the first five minutes of the first episode of this season, you get legionnaires and you go to Mars. How, how was that for the both of you? It just dawned on because things were left off in that very particular way from season three leading into season four. But the fact of the matter is for the both of you, the two things that I think were like at the height of what you could possibly want out of the season was given to you both within the first, I literally stopped and they basically arrive on Mars just under the five minute mark for the episode. So <laughs> like we have, we have that old uh, DC Daily interview thing that we did where we got asked, oh, what are you hoping for in season four? And I was like, I just want a super Martian wedding. And Rich was like, I just want Legionnaires. And literally the <laughs> fact that like, not only is the the opening bit of this season, the first couple episodes are like, here's Connor and McGann just having a good time on Mars within the first two minutes of the first episode of the season, which dropped as a surprise, um, like we didn't know when this was coming and it just arrived. Oh, that's right. I always forget that, that that did happen with season four. If it was wake up one day and like, that hey, totally happened. Young Justice is here now. And not only is Young Justice here now, the first episode, one of the first things I get is like Connor and McGann just telling me what their wedding plans are. And I'm like, yes, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> I am, as my notes say here, I am a parody of myself, but gosh, I love just seeing these two <laughs> characters be happy together. <laughs> um, yeah, hard same, hard same. I think I told the story. We were uh, honored to be invited up to um, Burbank for the airing of the season finale of last season. Yeah, season three. And yeah. um, so we're I'm sitting there with my wife and I'm, we're watching it with with the, the cast and the crew and you get to the very last scene where they show you know this blonde woman with a cup of coffee and a legion ring and i let i i my wife my wife hadn't caught the table i like stood up and yelled so loud that the table almost, almost flew forward and i looked over and matthew bordenave the storyboarder we, we've interviewed him you should check it out uh, Matthew Bordenave and, and Zeno are up on this little platform and they're just pointing at it because I think Matthew told Zeno, he's like, watch Rich. <laughs> and so while while we had interviewed Matthew and we're talking, I'm talking about the Legion in the interview, he's like, I storyboarded that scene and knew it was coming. And, yeah. and, so, and didn't and so tell I you because you NDAs. And didn't tell you that it was going to be there. Yeah, so he didn't tell, he didn't tell me. I was uh, in retrospect, I was a little embarrassed. My wife, I think, was a lot embarrassed because I was so excited. And then, of course, we just get Legion rings right at the beginning. So, like you, I am a parody of myself. So, yeah, Neil, uh, to answer your question, how did it feel? Much excitement. So, so happy. So very happy. Mm -hmm. So good. I just had to. Ju I just really felt compelled to jump in, just because it was so quickly. But I know Emily, you have a lot of things that are written down, so I'll let you. I'll let you take the reins from there. But I had to ask because my recollection had. I just had totally forgot, that, forgot how quick again, it was. Both of the things that I know <laughs> yes, you wanted, exactly. just like here, five minutes in, here, have this. Yes, mm, goodies. Yeah. So uh, jumping again at the very beginning of this episode, I have to shout out, I have to shout out that I will never stop screaming about how much I love the theme song remix for this season. It's just so good at evoking yeah. the original theme and hyping up the energy while feeling like grander and more yes. mature at the same time. It's just truly perfect vibes. I love the like opening sequence in this season so much because i love the original opening sequence so much and getting to see 
not a redo, but a remix really of that idea is so fun and so good. And I love it. And I know that doesn't have anything to do with the story, but it does have to do with the show. And I need to shout it out. No, it does though. It does though. Sets the mood, man. It does. It sets the mood for this season so well. And just, and rewatching it now, having seen the whole season and like paying attention to all the cool little background details that they do with that opening and all of the like cool design elements that they put into those. I'm like, all of these are perfect. These are perfect snapshots for the for each character. Yeah, and part of it's also trying to like re encapsulate like that conversation that were happening then because I forget that that first time watching that first intro, you see D the D designation, and so then mm-hmm. you know all these you like all these Easter eggs that are hidden. Um, not necessarily the the you know the quick shots of what will happen in an episode like in previous seasons, but still so much to pull out of that. And I would say I would say that like our you know our hats are always off to dynamic music partners. But they have like a, a like a trophy case full of things that tell them how amazing they are. But <laughs> yeah, they don't but need if us. they need it, if they need it, like I'm just I'm just throwing it out there again. Yes. Also, speaking of new things in this season, have I have I mentioned enough times how much I love McGann's redesign for this season? Have I again? <laughs> sometimes my notes are just a parody of myself. Of that, I feel like her design in this season is the perfect blend of all of the different forms and aspects of her that we have gotten throughout the series that it is the white martian skin and the black sclera eyes but also having her have like the feminine long hair and the more human form and like combining all of these things into me being like ah mcgann has figured herself out by this point like quote unquote we're all always figuring figuring ourselves out but like yeah. That being such a theme of her character, and we're going to see it more this season a little bit later on this arc. But like, I love that. And I love the look of it. I know everybody knows that I've shouted into eternity about how I love McGann with long hair and I love McGann looking awesome. And I'm just very happy with this being the design choice this season. <laughs> I promise I have other notes that are not just me being a parody of myself (laughs) but right now it's the beginning of the season so i have to touch on the being a parody of myself ones absolutely totally but with it like the idea that you know it obviously all of those things are conscious choices anytime she makes them but not only to make that conscious choice but even like the tough things and the tough conversations that are happening inside the episode but for, at no point is there any inkling that i can feel from her as a character to not be a white Martian, yeah. no matter what's still happening, no matter the, the stress that it, that's clearly going to bring for her. Um, but it's like you said, it's like she's finding herself more the longer we go, which makes sense when we started, uh, you know, 15 versus 25. But the, the idea that, like you said, it's that continued progression. And like that comes up in this episode of her whole conversation with Emery and being like, why would you change your name? And which we're going to get to later i keep forgetting which things are slightly later in this arc but like that initial confrontation with emery of emery thinking she should look human to make everyone more comfortable and also that she had to change her name to fit in as a green martian and all of those things versus mcgann in this episode who is like is confidently being exactly who she is with the name that she feels fits her in a society that is actively screaming at her at every time that she is doing it wrong, no matter what she is doing. And that's cool. That's interesting. Well, I also, I also like the, the immediate failure of trying to like make people more comfortable of like, why would you turn into that? It's, I don't stop it. Don't <laughs> yeah. turn into that. Oh, I'll turn into Rita. Oh, that's better. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and Beast Boy, Beast Boy just <laughs> struggling because that's also we are setting up some stuff with Beast Boy is struggling and no no one is making Beast Boy more comfortable. Hit the ground running. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's for crashing the mode, though. Other little things. This is a small detail, but I do have to give a shout out to as someone with too many big feelings about the Mars rovers. I like the little shot of one <laughs> yes. while they're flying in. It's a nice detail. And I also went on a deep drive trying to figure out which Martian rover it was supposed to be. And it looks like it's modeled off of Spirit and Opportunity, which NASA sent up in 2004, which is just, I think, an interesting timeline that in the Young Justice universe, we were still sending up Martian rovers. 
when whether or not we stopped once we found actual Martians in Young Justice. But it, it, but I think oh, I don't know if it's like a, a secondary like layered texture for it, but the idea that like. Uh, just going into the idea that one of the reasons that maybe in our reality we have not found anyone on Mars is because they're underground. Yeah. And then we go and it's just – if because you think that that little robot can only go it so can. far in a certain amount of time. So then it just can't find anyone because everyone's underground. <laughs> yep. Well, that's and that's kind of the thing they talk about with these rovers, right? So if some, if some alien sent a, you know, sent a probe here and it landed in the middle of, you know, Death Valley or whatever, yep. <laughs> like it's – possible in the range that it could go to it wouldn't run into anyone i think there was twilight zone episodes about stuff like that where a spaceship went up thought they were going to another planet and they landed in a desert and they didn't know where they were and what was happening because there was weird stuff going on and they were going to die and then they like went over a hill and saw a telephone pole and they were like oh wait what I thought we were on a terrible horrible alien planet trying to kill us nope it's just nope, it's just arizona which is also the very cool <laughs> right. thing of us yep. Finally getting to see what uh, Martian society looks like after only having references and brief mentions in the comics and things like that and being like, it's underground because the surface of Mars is still super inhospitable, but it's underground and it's the coolest looking thing. <laughs> it's just giant, ever expanding underground cities that like are built at every angle because everyone can fly and are bioship accessible and it's it's cool. Everything is cool. And that's the thing, like in the comics, I don't I I mean I'm sure it's happened some point in time in the comics, but mostly Martian Manhunter is like, you know, the last member of his species no. and mm-hmm. you know, some terrible apocalypse has happened. So we haven't I don't I think um, almost all of this, if not all of it, is entirely new. So there was nothing really that we had to go on. So this this whole societal thing, though there's been white Martians and red Martians and stuff in the comics and various re- references, the reds vaguely, not so much like getting to see an active society. So this was super cool. In the YJ tie-in comics, like the one glimpse we have gotten from Mars is in the issue where McGann tells her fake backstory. So even that those yeah, even those glimpses that we get of like what Mars looks like are intentionally slightly off. Like there's we talked about it in our um like tie-in comic discussion yeah. episode in our comics commentaries of like one of the panels is clearly based off like a Norman Rockwell painting and stuff like that of like they are all tinged with McGann's <laughs> American TV consumption of how she is explaining Martian society and I'm like now we get to see the real version and it's so cool. I also like this, like just the the overall just lore building and the idea that seeing the structure and I, I, you know, if I assume something is like an intentional thought, it's probably just the best to just assume that the intention was had because that's how the show works. But the idea that in Martians not requiring the same level of infrastructure as other species would because you have telepathic communication as your as your mode. So then why? Why? I don't have to have these phone lines or even really the internet or yeah. all of these things because I could just take the stuff in my brain and I could just put it into your brain willingly or un. But um, yeah, the idea that like that, that thought of not having to have these like super expansive open areas or having all these thoroughfares or anything like that. It's just interesting to see that. Like I assume um, that that was thought about. Yeah. Playing off like, the amount of thought that goes into not just um, the fact that you have a society where people can phase through walls <laughs> if they're trained enough, you know, or fly or telepathically communicate. So you don't need to have those kinds of inf- infrastructures. It's also how do you translate that to animation, right? So like you're saying, like, would buildings, you know, just be on the ground and our doors rectangles and whatever, you know, like things that we take for granted here. No, they can be anywhere because almost everybody can fly as far as I know. Right. Or do we even need doors? Is there just a designated space that you phase through the wall? (laughs) I don't know. Could be. I mean, you could. Thinking about that, like all the doors look the way that like Bioship does opening and stuff because phasing is an advanced Martian technique. We need to have accessibility for the children and stuff who are learning. Uh, Think about Uh, the children. (laughs) Um, But yeah, but how do you... So what I was saying, like, how do you translate that into animation? And it's stuff like 
things that some a telepathic society would take for granted, like when you like we speak out loud, we speak out loud. If if we want to talk to one person, we have to either leave the room or whisper really quietly and hope no one hears us. But there, you know, they show that they can have a private conversation with, you know, just an individual or a couple of individuals, right? And we've seen this through the whole series, but the way that they show it on Earth is just they just don't say anything and and they're just talking through their brains. But here they do the thing where they blur the background. Yes. And so it's this thing that's just kind of this beautiful, like subtle thing of like, no, that's kind of how it feels in their brain. It's like, no, I'm just kind of blurring you all out. Like there's something, how do you, how do you get that internal feeling into a visual medium is impressive. And establishing that upfront in this first episode so that they can use it throughout the rest of this arc without having to tell you right. that that's what's going yeah. on. Cause like, Connor and McGann do it throughout the rest of this arc as a thing and just having it, that first interaction of it be Connor just saying private channel and then turning and just blurring out the background. And you're like, oh, cool. That's how we're going to communicate this from now on. Amazing. Right. And that's from a storytelling standpoint, too. That's kind of how you do that. And maybe we can get into that in a, in a canary debrief. But And speaking of like the all the interesting world building stuff with the Martians and things of all the intentional little things some of which are explicitly called out in the episode and some of which you just observe and get into like i love thinking about how good this show is with linguistics sometimes and like there is a clear subtextual difference between how martians say earthlings and how martians say earthers and it's never touched on Mm -hmm. and it's never explained but you get it and you can hear it in the voice Mm -hmm. acting and it's so good it's just one of the many very cool, fun, interesting things of how they are establishing everything about Mars. Of like, this show took one episode and was like, we have to establish an entire different culture so that we can deal with some of the societal problems of that culture over the course of just a handful of episodes. And it works. <laughs> um, and it's interesting mm-hmm. and it's fun. I mean, that said, it, I mean, and I know it was uh, brought up when the episodes were first coming out. The use of Gar as kind of our touch point of learning about Mars did, at for a brief moment, feel a little um, heavy handed in terms of just like, so and so, can anybody be a yellow? Yeah. Why, yes, they can. And if they have affinity for it, and da 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 da. That is the one bit in this episode where I'm like, okay, that yeah. bit feels a little exposition y, but also you needed to get that exposition out so we can do the rest of this thing. Oh, so totally. I'm not going to yeah. be too annoyed about it. Yeah, and it also it didn't it didn't kill the episode. No. Like I've watched nope. stuff with exposition like that, and I'm like I'm already done with whatever the show is. Right? It didn't do that. It's just like sometimes you're just like, oof, yeah, I see you. <laughs> you're gonna need to get some information out in a reasonable time. Yeah, and it was only for like a, a like a couple lines in there that I noticed, like kind of getting that feeling, and then it was over, and I had all the information I could possibly need, so that when you have a, a yellow Martian show up. I don't have a myriad of questions. I mean, I'm sure I still have some, but I don't. I I'm not baffled by the existence of a, a new color showing up. You have narrative and character questions, not wait, what, who, where, why, how. Yes. And why am I watching this? That's not a question you ever want someone to ask. Other than that, I think I've gotten to kind of the more little things on mine. But uh, rewatching this episode. No matter how many times it happens, I still enjoy the running joke of this series of Connor just always trying to remind people that he's half Kryptonian <laughs> of whether it's people assuming he is all Kryptonian or all human and him just trying and then giving up. I'm like, I don't know why this is always funny to me, but gosh, I love Connor trying his best. And another thing from a comedy from a comedy standpoint is you, you like it's kind of a callback to the other things, yeah, yeah. but it's also not heavy, heavy handed, right? It's not overdone. Yeah. Just enough to be like, huh, that's still happening. Okay, cool. And then you move on. <laughs> no matter what planet he is on, he is running into this problem. I also, rewatching, really think it's really cool. One of the little design details of when they are walking through the city and they're showing all of the different Martians and like this little snapshot of life uh, on Mars and showing the Martians that have like modeled their forms off of tv personalities and stuff several of them still have martian skin colors while being in a different form like mcgann did in season <laughs> one and i'm like that's cool that's a good detail i like it uh nice like there's like a i think it's like there's a g gordon godfrey that has like dark green skin still and i'm like fun interesting good <laughs> and 
Uh, the I have a note here that simply says, and I love McGann's parents, which is true. They're good and supportive, <laughs> and I like them. They're trying their best. I get that Me they too. have... There's, there are problems to deal with later in this arc, but they're just they're just so happy that their kid's getting married, and they're very sweet about it. I love Matt Moores, who's like, I don't know what a wedding ring is. What are you talking about? <laughs> what, what? If only you watched more television. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good and it's fun. Also, 27 kids is too many. It's just too many. I've got two and I love them dearly. 27 is too many. Uh, technically 28 because it's McGann has 27 siblings. Right. Uh, 27 <laughs> siblings. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of parents, though, the fact that it's Carl Lumley voicing her dad is not lost on me because not only has he previously been, so he was John Jones in the Justice League cartoon previously, but not mm-hmm. only that, he's Martian Manhunter's dad in the live action Arrowverse as well. So then to have him come oh, in and be her, yeah. be her um, father is just, I mean, the man's the man's built to be a Martian, I guess. But he's got the per- got the quintessential. There's voice, just something so. about that guy. He's got the voice of a Martian. <laughs> That's right. That's fantastic. Neil, what do you got? Um, so our sixteens. There's only a couple, and it's just in the in the time signatures. Um, so you can look for them. They're not as exciting when they're only in the time signatures, but they're there. Um, so that's kind of what we have. I had totally forgotten that Snapper got married and that um, <laughs> now they're fo- that they're fostering Cullen and Harper. And I previously, so I was trying to do a rewatch. I got through season one. I jumped to season four so I could prep. And I had just apparently in my brain took all of season three and season four and just kind of just pushed them together. So when I started, I was like, wait, huh? Why does, what are you? Oh no! All of those thoughts happened prior to this episode occurring. Yeah, there was it was a lot. It was very jarring for me to take in initially, and then also having Snapper marry Bethany. I mean, that's how it worked. That's how it went in the comics. So it's not um, not surprising that's how it went here. So the second she was introduced in season three, I don't know that I would have said that. Yeah, season four starting, they're just gonna be married and have two foster <laughs> children. I don't think I could have predicted that much, um, but that's what's happening. It's the grand young justice tradition of we found these troubled teens and uh, they're ours now, I guess. Uh, (laughs) We've been (laughs) doing this since season one. Thankfully, I live on all this property and have space above my garage and extra rooms in my home to just collect them all. It's not like he doesn't have a whole bunch of super powered people to help him put extensions on his house. True. Oh, Oh, can I park my car in the garage? No, that's where his (laughs) tube is. (laughs) <laughs> isn't that where you guys put your zetas yeah. yeah well i mean speaking speaking of zeta tubes i have a lot of theoretical questions and we've had these questions before so i'm happy to have this discussion a secondary time but obviously this you know while we can all agree that the seasons don't necessarily leave on cliffhangers the episode definitely left on a cliffhanger yeah. with with the explosion don't know what's going to happen blah 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 but when a person is entering a Zeta tube and can you hear through a Zeta tube and how all of that's going still just baffles me. I do not understand the technology or how it is supposed to function. So Neil, uh, a Zeta tube works on Zeta radiation, which works in ways I don't know or understand. <laughs> I ah. The Zeta tube works however it needs to work for this thing i could like this is all fair questions and i have no idea i simply run with whatever the show presents me on how zeta tubes work totally agree i can talk to how i always imagine i never thought about it but I, there is a way that i imagine it works but it's kind of like a like a star trek transporter you yeah. know because it it, it kind of breaks you down into energy transports you to a location and then rebuilds you on the other side is how i picture it as opposed to like portals yeah, like a what's the word? Uh, Stargate, like Stargate. It's it's like you walk in. It kind of does the same thing, but I think you can reach through. No, they can't. They can get radio signals through a portal. Yeah, and you can hear. Well, and and in the you, the Zeta tubes, you can hear a conversation that's happening on the other side, or at least I remember that at some point being happening. Oh yeah, or was it happening? Like I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna have to look closer now. But yeah. I swear that I swear that happened at one point, but well, just luckily, no, because there's the thing of there's the thing of 
Artemis and Robin Zeta into the cave in season one directly into a fight, having no idea that that is going to be what they walk into. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. So, yeah. Yeah, I had to. I yeah, the dug in my up. mind and pulled out. Wait, I have the one example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't. I don't know if you can hear through it. Yeah, but I don't know. Well, let's watch the rest of the season. See if there's anything that comes up. Let's do it. Well, I was gonna say the other thing is, and it happened last season, less so comparatively to this season, but utilizing all of the available runtime. And turning the credits into something more than just credits. And it's interesting because I think I think that hit in a lot of different ways for different people, um, just in the sense that like people wanted more. And it's like, yeah, but you can't you can't really do a lot because you have to still show the credits. That That's part of what has to happen yeah. um, as part of a show. But the fact that we're even getting as much as we are getting, uh, that's amazing. What a, what a wonderful use of that time and space and um you know, in budget and everything like that, but just utilizing those extra a minute or so to continue to flesh out the world. Yeah, agreed. I think they're used really well and really interestingly, especially as like you can kind of see that slow evolution of how we got to this point over like last season of going like, oh, the credits aren't just going to get shoved to half of the screen because we're not on Cartoon Network anymore. We're not going to be having an ad playing at the same time of our credits. Maybe we do something with that to being like, oh, we could could really do something with that mm-hmm. and turning it into a whole thing that gives you an extra mini little good little monologue scene. They're very fun. I like them. And there's so many there's so many scenes where we're just like, gosh, you know, I really wish I had a scene. I wonder what that conversation was like. Like, oh, this thing sets up a dynamic. I don't want to I don't want to crash the mode on anything later, but there's one in particular that I think of that I was just like, oh, yeah, uh, wow. You know, like that conversation, I didn't realize I wanted to hear a little bit of that conversation until it happened. And then I was like, oh, I'm so glad that I got it. So I love the way that they use that space. Fun little bonus epilogues. Yeah, exactly. It's an epilogue. It's what it is. You know, it's like a little... Yeah, in that, like, I think there were a lot of concerns about Wolf and their age and how they're doing. And I, I, it felt so warranted in those moments because Wolf is often doing very little, um, if anything at all. And I've come to find out, no, Wolf has always been lazy. They're like, hey, Wolf, watch out so that Red Tornado doesn't find us in his apartment. Wolf is just asleep and they 100% does nothing from season one. <laughs> so there was no cause for concern. Wolf was like, you're telling me I don't have to yeah. fight mutant animals in the f- jungle anymore? Great. I am taking naps. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'm, I'm done. Good. I am napping the rest of my life. <laughs> exactly. Stick around. Class is in session. Hey, everyone. So we touched on this a little earlier today. So I want to try and dive into this. This idea that when you're introducing a particularly a new world, this can happen with magic systems when you're talking about a fantasy world or how technology works, whether you're going hard sci-fi or science fantasy, doing a Star Wars thing or Star Trek and how that kind of blurs some lines. Whatever you do when you're establishing a world or in this case, even though it's like season four, kind of establishing a new way of using something that you've already established. Start early, drop the seeds of how it works, and then be consistent. So we've talked earlier about this blurring in the background. They know we're going to need private conversations in a society where everyone is telepathic. How do we do that in a visual medium, right? What trigger or signal do we need to to show the people without telling the people every single time? Do we need to go to a private conversation? Let's do that. And then click it in. Um, If you're writing a script for something, then one of your instincts might be like, I need to have a verbal clue because I'm literally writing dialogue. But when you're in a full creative uh, space where you're trying to create something, say, for example, a movie, animated series, you know, those kinds of things, you've got a big team that's working on it. Hopefully you have these discussions about how to show something visually so you don't have to do it auditorily every single time or verbally every single time. When you're writing a novel, it's having the consistency of, say, a person's perspective and feeling, right? There's a certain kind of magic that is showing up. It's an antagonistic magic. This person feels a particular way when that antagonistic magic is around, have that bit of feeling that leads into 
that into the approach of that antagonistic ma- magic and then be consistent with it. So when you are consistent with it, when you do make little changes, you understand. So for example, if you're having this visual of this blurred background for a private conversation between two people that are speaking telepathically, well, what about somebody who has the ability to penetrate through that, right? To be able to overhear a conversation. Then you do something with the background that drops a hint that something odd is happening right? Something subtle. So, and then when a reference is made later about how, oh, you know, antagonist B overheard this conversation, you can be like, wait, I thought it was private. And then you go back and you're like, whoa, there's this visualization that is, that was there that I didn't realize. And they were, but if you're not consistent every single time you do a thing, you can't play with the consistency. You have to earn the trust. So establish something early if you're going to be doing something, particularly with magic systems, and stick with that unless you really clearly explain and have a really good plot reason for that consistency to change. How is that? Perfect. I was going to say, magic magic and technology are the two things that always require it. Go watch a movie where you like the time travel in it, and there's only one rule about time travel. It's follow your own rules. Done. I don't care what the rules are as long as you follow them. That's it. That's all I've ever needed. Yeah. I, am, I am but a simple man. <laughs> and all I need <laughs> is that if you establish rules, you follow them. But I also thought of like it's something like Young Justice, the idea that having that blurred background, having someone that you find out later has listened to a conversation, I can already see all of us going back into that episode, scrubbing the background and seeing that one person in the background crystal clear. And everything else is blurred. And then there's your visual representation. Yeah, that's a that you beautiful have, way to show that. Yeah, only one to two frames, maybe like hidden in the background. But then, you, like I said, you fi- have that revelation, come back, and then there they are. I love day. it. Beautiful way to do that. Exactly. All right. Where are we at? Oh, fan service. We need some fan service. I don't know how much fan service has been going on. I got it. You got one? You do? Oh, great. You got one? Do it. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. This one is interesting because I think we're more directly servicing fans with the information that I will now provide. Uh, But currently in Canada, season one is back on Netflix. (laughs) So I, I say that to say, just keep going out there just with... They're just the ever growing shuffle that is Warner Brothers and HBO Max, just Max Discovery. Who owns it now? We don't know who owns it tomorrow. I don't know. We definitely don't know. But the idea <laughs> the, the idea that those contracts and everything are shifting constantly. Some things are moving over to Amazon Prime. Some things are moving to Hulu. But as a Young Justice fan, I would say check your local area and your service, whatever service providers you have to see if Young Justice is available for you. Nice. Consult your local listings. Yeah. <laughs> go, to your, go to your grocery store. Pick up a TV guide and see if you can find reruns of Young Justice. Oh, oh that's amazing. Go- but yeah, I literally, I so as of yesterday, I saw a post that Canada has, and unfortunately, it's only season one, but it is currently available um, for Netflix users. Just go back to the true olden days of Young Justice of checking Wikipedia for the plot summary for next week's episode, and then inevitably it being wrong so often of people just making up oh, lies. Yeah. This was an ongoing thing in the Young Justice fan. Like I remember this thing of how people would be like, like the one that's coming to mind is there was one like infamous time that the description for some episode was like Robin leaves the team and blah blah and everybody was like Wikipedia says Robin's leaving the team <laughs> a thing that never happened. Yeah, did you see the first two words you used on your definitive statement was Wikipedia says. says. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry BB, we can't risk altering the time stream. We do that we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 4, but in Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculation about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. We're in Crashing the Mode. Emily, what do you have? Garfield sure is having a time. 
Garfield is having a having a time, even this early episode one, and they are slowly laying the groundwork for by the end of this arc, we will find out uh, that Garfield is having a time because he got brain blasted by some Martians, uh, but he's also having a time because of all that trauma and depression from the past season, two seasons, all three previous seasons. Life. <laughs> His past yeah. life. That's only going to continue escalating and being looked into for the rest of the season and it is wild knowing where this is going to eventually get us and seeing the earliest steps of us getting there are just garfield being cranky on a long road trip and kind of isolating himself from all of the people who care about him uh while also just missing talking to all the people who care about him at the same time and just having a time like it's the only way i can describe it garfield is going through everything all at once and it it's also so wild these early episodes seeing how everybody is just giving mundane explanations for it because nobody because garfield has for so long been putting up the front of i'm fine i'm totally fine that when he is having this time where he is clearly not doing fine everyone's like oh he must just be having a bad day Oh, it's just, it's the long trip. It's the being away from Earth. It's that he's bored, whatever it may be. Only for us to eventually get to the point of like, no, please send Beast Boy to Black Canary and let her help. Yes, that's what she's there for. Well, and in retrospect, like looking at it now, I mean, there was, there's definitely flack at the time about how long it takes for certain things to happen, certainly. Yeah. One, uh, it, it makes so much more sense watching it now how expedited his journey is in terms of the things that will happen by having hostile Martians just brain blast you and having to then cope with feelings that are coming up in a very negative way. You're not having a positive outlet to discuss those. The other thing is, I think. I don't know of another way to say this, but like I think what the approach that was taken here is uncomfortably realistic. Yeah. In the sense that while we do have all these super powered people, yeah. uh, the second word I used is people. They're they're just people at the end of it, and that's why we enjoy this show as much as we do. And having people being too uncomfortable to address what they think might actually be happening with Gar is probably one of the unfortunately one of the most realistic approaches to someone's mental health problems now that was not a light note my bad <laughs> uh, it's it's super painful watching gar <laughs> it's just real painful like how many times you're just like when is when is the therapy session supposed to happen like where where's the check-ins you know where's the you know, I mean, Black Canary is doing a lot of things. Not we on her, I guess. That's so not a thing, many more like... superpowered psychologists in this universe. There's two. They have two, <laughs> and they keep talking about how every... they've had two that need to check in with people. I don't literally at the end of this episode where Black Canary is yeah. like, uh, Jefferson has asked me and McGann to check in with every member of the league, the team, and the outsiders, and I'm like, that's yeah. three teams being helped by. Two therapists, one of whom is gone right now. Somebody's, and you know what? Yeah, somebody's going to slip through the cracks. It's just, it's just going to happen. Like, there's only so much time, space, energy to be able to do stuff, and it happens in real life too. Unfortunately, like um, people who need help don't ask for help. Uh, people who are trying to check in with people, they're being either dismissed or those people are like, "I'm good," or they put on a face. It's hard. I had a family member just recently i hadn't seen him since i was younger but he was a cousin of mine who committed suicide and he he just fell through the cracks and didn't ask for help and didn't people didn't see how much he was hurting because he managed to put on a face and you know it, it's hard it's really hard so watching watching this happening with garfield during this season too it's it's one of those things that i think greg was saying like you know i want people to come out of a season and feel like the characters are real Right. There's some real thing that people can relate to about these characters. This was real. It's real hard. It's real painful to watch. So, and, and it feels real. Yeah. Even this first episode, you have Gar that's like, in every instance where people do try to check in with him, I don't think he's necessarily lying. He just hasn't even come to terms with it himself. Like McGann is like, why have you been so cranky this entire trip? And the thing he says is, I haven't gotten enough sleep. 
I can't sleep. The bunks are too quiet. And I think that is entirely true. I don't think Gar is lying about that. I think Gar just is like, it's too quiet and I can't sleep because I'm up thinking all night about everything that is troubling Gar this whole season. But it's like, yeah, it's that thing of he is yeah. very much like even there are even this early in the show moments where people try to be like, are you OK? And he's like, I'm fine. And like, there's nothing they can do about that. That becomes the problem yeah. for the whole season with what Gar is dealing with. Of Every time people try to reach out, they are told, don't worry about me until we get to a point of like, this is an intervention. Which, again, I think is what we were saying of it is feels very real. And I think that was why some people were <laughs> uncomfortable with this storyline of it. It happens so gradually in terms of showing everything Gar ends up going through. Yeah. You know, as a as a nurse, uh, one of the things that I would ask people, this is an example when I would talk to people, it's like when I ask you, are you in pain? Yeah. Are you in are you in any pain? Pretty common nurse question. Watch Baymax and Big Hero 6. On a scale of 1 to 10, when you ask somebody that question, the question I'm asking is, are you in any pain? But the question people answer is, am I in more pain than I deal with yeah. on a daily basis? That's the question they're answering. It's not the question I'm asking because their baseline of quote unquote normal is different for every person. And when somebody is asking Garfield a question like, are you okay? What he's answering is, is there anything you can do to help me? No, <laughs> there's nothing you can do to help me because you're asking me, am I okay? And I say, no, I'm not okay. And what are you going to offer a hug? Like, it's not bringing my mom back to life. All my mom's back to life, right? Like, it's not going to, it's not going to be able to help me. And so that's the question people are often asking is they project to, is there something that you can do to make me feel better? And no, there isn't because I'm trapped in what's happening right now. And I don't feel like there's anything that that can be done to help me or I would have done it already. You know, it's yeah. hard. We got real deep, deep in this crashing. The I, can, I, can, I can help bring us up. Welcome back to the speaking, show. Speaking of parentage, it was not lost on me. And I, cause I, I put this here because I couldn't quite remember where it where we really find out that Bioship has had a child. But the fact that. Connor oh, right, is right. like, well, what do bioships do for fun? Martian Mandalorian is blah, 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 just, <laughs> just like goes right over the top of him, just cuts him off in like a super uncomfortable, like, you know, pr almost prudish way of like, we don't want to talk about that. And then, <laughs> yeah, go, go watch it again. I don't think I caught it the first time, but like the, the, like the tonal inflection of just like, no, no, I'm not talking about it. And then just like moving conversation away from, oh, I wonder what they do for fun. Yeah, so there, there you go. That that that's that one. <laughs> also, I've always wondered if Forager knows Bioship's not coming back, yeah. based on the way that he interacts and is just absolutely distraught. I think um, so. I I do as well. And same with Sphere because they both roll, you know, roll. <laughs> they both roll over there and then um, say their goodbyes. And it is definitely a lot more somber there, like when they leave than yeah. anybody else. Yeah, because we know. Absolutely. McGann has some idea of what's up with Bioship. Like, McGann knows about baby Bioship before anybody else. Though we see later she gets told that Bioship isn't coming back. I don't know. That's just a thought. I think you're right. I think Forager probably probably knew. Probably was sad. Probably didn't tell anybody. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave my other one. So I th uh -huh. I, I'm my modes have crashed. I think the other one's a good discussion for a different time. One of my other notes is just I like that we get the setup this early in this episode of a sandstorm is coming so that when we get to like the third episode where that becomes a problem, we have already set that up. So that episode doesn't have to be like, Oh no, a sandstorm. The Martian weather report says nobody go on the surface. So we get, <laughs> that was your Martian announcer. I like it. Martian radio sounds like it's from the 1940s. So no, well, yeah, the, the, the TV's from the 60s, so. <laughs> the Martian weather report for the day <laughs> is exactly sandstorms like across the board. Uh, Hot cha news from the front. You sound, like, you sound like the radio announcer from Cora. Yes, who sounds <laughs> like all of the 1940s right, yeah. radio that's, that's, announcers. Right. Um, it's a voice I love doing. He is raising his hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, no, I am in danger. <laughs> um, oh, no, I'm in danger. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, not stuck with that. that Old timey radio now. announcer is one of my favorite impressions, actually. <laughs> it's um, a good one. It's fun it's a good to do. Go-to. Um, but yeah, <laughs> on the serious note of this, I do like that that is set up this early as we are coming in and is casually dropped as a mention so that when it becomes later a huge obstacle of, oh no, right. we have lost a, uh, a suffocating Superboy in a sandstorm with a Garfield who is not functioning at his best right now. You're like, oh, oh no, <laughs> like. We establish that up front so that we can get to it at a thematically appropriate time. But now, Rich, I I hand the mic to you uh, to oh. just say, hey, uh, what's up with the Legionnaires? <laughs> hey, there's Legionnaires in this episode. I'm good. Okay. No, that's it. No, there's. <laughs> so we've been speculating that this who this blonde would be. Right. It turns out it's, it's Saturn girl, which is perfect because she's telepathic and they're dealing with telepathic society stuff. They brought Chameleon Boy with them, who's the one who's shape changed into that green Martian, right? And then they brought Phantom Girl with them. So I don't know. It's like let's bring the three three Legionnaires that all together make a Martian. Like <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Phantom Girl flies and fly. They they all fly because they have their Legion flight rings. But Phantom Girl phases through objects, shape changing and telepathy. We're just gonna get all the bases covered one way or the other, which is great. But the design. That's the thing. When I see Legionnaires in new reboots, because there's been so many Legionnaire reboots, go back if you, if you want to hear wax poetic about about the Legion. Go back and listen to my interview with Jamie about Legion. It's a three, the only three part interview I think we had, and so we talk about it in length. But the design of the costuming here is fantastic. Phantom Girl. A lot of the aliens that are in the Legion in the comics, they look basically just human with different color hair. Or, you know, maybe a slight different skin tone. But like there's something different about this is this is not a design of Phantom Girl I've ever seen. This kind of uh this take on Chameleon Boy 2, perfect. Now Saturn Girl is human. She comes from the moon of Titan, where there's a human settlement there. So she is actually human, so she just looks the way that she does. But the design of the costumes and stuff is fantastic and fabulous. And then this whole thing with Laura Zod, I don't know. Do we want to talk about Laura Zod now or later? We can just say that guy in a weird energy sphere is Laura Zod. There's we'll a guy in a weird energy him. sphere. Yeah, let's do that. His name's Laura Zod. I thought it was somebody else. Oh, yeah. I thought it was. I thought it was somebody else. <laughs> you thought I it mean, was at least three about... people before we found out oh, who it uh, actually was. Sure. And 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 one hundred percent of them were not this guy. <laughs> this is absolutely not not who I predicted in any way. <laughs> who this guy was. And I had to like, when he came up, I had to look him up and, uh, and do some, do some research. We can talk about him in a, in a future episode, but um, there's a dude, the mysterious person. Now I've got my 1920s, thirties, whatever old timey radio. And that mystery sticks around for such a long amount of time in this season. Yeah, it does for a bit. Yeah. And it was like, I was like, wait, who, what, who's this? <laughs> that's not anybody. That's not any of the 53 people I guessed. <laughs> Yeah, rewatching these episodes, I was like, I was like, there is stuff from this arc that does not get answered until the last five minutes of the finale. Like, we are gonna get into <laughs> some stuff in Crashing the Mode this season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think I'm gonna leave it at that. So um, the Legion's fantastic. I'm obviously excited about them. I loved the designs. I like how they introduced them into this. It gets in Phantom Girl also what happens with her uh, a little bit later as well, I think was a, a fantastic take on what was going on and the ability to kind of incorporate the Legion in. I do have questions. I want to see an entire spinoff that's just the Legion in Young Justice style written, <laughs> written <laughs> produced by Greg and Brandon. I think we're not going to get that, but I absolutely want that. And uh, I think that's it for me. Yeah. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star 
review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.